Hey everyone and welcome back. My name is Courtney, I'm here with Royce, and together we are the Ace Couple. Now, a couple weeks ago, we did a sort of a two-part episode. We did two different episodes, rather, uh, that were both very heavily centered around the intersections of disability and asexuality. And as a disabled woman, I had a lot of personal anecdotes from my life. So that was a lot of Courtney talking and Royce adding witty observations wherever possible. So I, I wanted to really get Rice talking a little more. I thought it would be very interesting to have an episode where we talk more about gender and pronouns because Rice has a an experience that is completely separate and unique from mine in that respect. So I really hope that you enjoy what we have to talk about today. So I guess for starters, Royce, you have a somewhat complicated relationship with gender. Can you explain a little bit about that for the folks at home? Uh, sure. I don't really consider my relationship with gender to be complicated, but I guess all of the complexities are in the translation. I don't seem to have much of a concept or affinity for gender. It, it None of it really makes sense to me. It's, I think that I see gender as a social construct, and as a result, I'm not drawn towards any particular term myself. Because of that, logically, I think that I'm best described as agender. I acknowledge that I grew up and am usually interacted with as if I were cisgender, and that doesn't bother me at all. But it's not quite accurate either. And I guess that's where things get complex, because when you say accurate, what do you mean? I, I don't think that when the average person out there thinks about a cisgender man, they have the same things come to their mind that I have when I think about myself. And that's what I'm trying to get at here is I don't... The concept of gender just doesn't resonate with me. So do I think that... A gender makes more sense given that. Yes, but the term cisgender like has absolutely no emotional pull on me one way or the other. Which I do want to circle back for a moment to you saying that to you gender is a social construct. I want to just get out of the way that it is. It is a social construct. I mean, in our modern society, in most cultures online, you'll you'll hear about the gender binary, you know, the cis normativity of there is male or female, but we just know that scientifically that is not correct, but that is what our our culture has created. And there are many cultures who throughout history have had a third gender, even a fourth gender, or or non-binary genders, like, th this is a thing, we know it exists, and despite the fact that it is a social construct, there are a large number of people who do associate themselves with a gender, whether it's male, female, even some people who treat, you know, their non-binary nature as a third gender, but not everybody does, so... What, what you're kind of saying is you just would rather do away with all of it. <laughs> you don't associate with any of those terms whatsoever. I don't associate with any of those terms or groups, uh, yes. And I think that's, if I were to look more into my life in general, I think that I have a tendency to not associate with groups. Being someone who has always been non-religious, never been a part of a like a church group. I've never really I've understood that people have favorite sports teams. I've never gotten the concept. I once received a short little essay back in high school English class with like a red sad face written on it from the teacher because the little essay was about how I had absolutely no school spirit. Oh. <laughs> That's really funny. Did you at least get a good grade? <laughs> Yes, the writing was sound. It was uh, <laughs> the grade was fine. Well, you you've often uh, described yourself as being president of the Go Home Club in high school. Yes, no extracurriculars, no no group activities. 
which is the opposite of me. I was in absolutely everything and anything I possibly could fit into my schedule and then some. So that is different. But, you know, I also, I am a woman. I do feel (laughs) that I am female. And I can still know that gender is a social construct, but I still very much identify with it. So, and, and since female is what I was assigned at birth, I am a cisgender woman. And so we do have very different relationships to gender in that sense. So by us saying that gender is a social construct, that is in no way negating anybody who does have strong feelings toward gender in any direction, whether you're cis or trans, um, whether you're non-binary, this does not discredit anybody's internal feelings, because at the end of the day, you know, don't be a jerk and treat people with <laughs> the way they identify with. It It should be that simple. But for you, you've used the word a gender to describe yourself, and I remember years ago, we even <laughs> kind of created the term meh gender to describe you. And I think that was really for the purpose of really emphasizing the apathy that you have toward gender. But you often seem kind of reluctant to talk about gender identity and pronouns. And since gender is a thing that we know to be fluid and diverse vocabulary is becoming increasingly more accessible, I just wanted to sort of get your pocket dictionary of terms that are passable enough for you, I suppose, because I I know other people are going to want to identify with the term because language is how we often understand things. Well, I think I tend to talk about gender in in two different ways. And one of those ways is a very abstract, logical, social sort of way where I'm removing myself from the conversation entirely and I'm trying to look at if we were to attempt to restructure working language today what is the most inclusive way to do it? Would language be better served by having fewer gendered terms and gendered prefixes and suffixes and gendered connotations that that go along with words? Probably so. But when it comes to myself, I just don't care. And (laughs) I I don't know if not caring is, is really the right way to phrase it. And that's why I think sometimes these conversations can get a little difficult or maybe even a little frustrating because it's all in this it's all muddied up in this translation layer where I have either either a feeling or the absence of a feeling, and I just don't know how to convey that when we have words that are different. It's like you were talking about growing up as a cisgendered woman in society and feeling an affinity towards that in some manner. I feel like when I got old enough to just start being aware that gender was a thing and that there were masculine connotations to thing to anything to any part of society i just kind of thought that doesn't make sense that's a stereotype and i just kind of threw the whole thing out so i think that those terms those terms don't have meaning to me at all and i can't really articulate the absence of meaning which is very interesting because as, as I was hearing you talk, I, I had uh, two main thoughts. Uh, first of all, your, your very uh, analytical side that you, you think of devoid of yourself can, in my experience, often get into like post-genderism territory, which I don't agree with everything about post-genderism, but that's really like a the the concept of eroding the social role of gender, which I think can be good in some ways, but it's it's incredibly complicated, and I don't... <laughs> we can't get into talking about the nuances of post-genderism today. There is just too much there. However, when you, when you also said you grew up as a, a cisgender woman, I almost flinched at that a little bit, because I am a cisgender woman now, But when I actually think about having grown up, I remember as a as a child, I I drew things all the time. I would I would draw 
you know, cartoons. I'd try to draw realistic depictions of things. I would draw whatever I saw right in front of me, or I'd try to make up my own creatures. And I very distinctly remember, like, sitting on the floor next to my toy chest when I was really young, and I had just learned at school about pie charts, <laughs> like the, the very introductory level of pie charts <laughs> that they teach you in elementary school. And I remember trying to use a pie chart to define myself. And, you know, at the time we were growing up, there was this very, very ever-present concept of like, oh, are you a girly girl or are you a tomboy? <laughs> like that, and, and we called that feminism because you can choose which type of girl you want to be. Horribly antiquated, but just being presented with that all of the time and having so many friends who were girls who either identified as a tomboy or a girly girl... I, I remember really thinking about that, and I was like, if I'm going to pie chart my own identity here, I remember drawing a pie chart that was 50-50, and on one part I said 50% girl, 50% boy, and I was like, that's me, that's Courtney, but then I scribbled it out, grabbed a new piece of paper, made a pie chart that was 25% girl, 25% boy, 50%. And I, I stopped for a moment because I was going to write other, but then I was like, no, Courtney. So I, I had this pie chart that was 25% boy, 25% girl, and 50% Courtney slash other. And so I think back to that because that was at a very young age. And had I grown up in a society that sort of introduced gender fluidity to me at a young enough age that seems like it could have been the natural progression of things. So when I think of my own gender identity now, I think it is very much shaped by my experiences. And I don't want anyone to cringe at that because I know there are a lot of people who say, you know, this is the gender I was born as, this is who I am and innately have always been. And if that is you, that is valid. <laughs> Nothing we're saying about our own personal experience is meant to discredit anyone else's experience because this is truly very abstract stuff we're talking about. So it can present in, in any number of ways. But, you know, I am very large-breasted, and I was the first girl in my class to need to wear a bra, and so I was very, like, hypersexualized at a very young age, which as, as a young asexual person, that would, had its own set of challenges. But I, I very much went through being hypersexualized way too young, being a teenage woman who had a, a very feminine body and just sort of learning to grapple with that and learning to accept myself. And there was just a lot there that sort of, sort of a, a reclamation. I had to reclaim my gender, which may or may not had been there before. So I, I do think that the fact I'm a woman is very much shaped by my own experiences. I have two comments I was holding on to. When you were telling the story about your pie chart, I was really hoping that it was going to be a moment where it was like, I am 40% girl and 40% boy and 20% dinosaur or something. Like, <laughs> you found the box of all of one particular type of toy. I am 20% a dinosaur. Well, <laughs> that wouldn't have been too out of character as a child. I, at the time... I mean, there have been way more dinosaurs discovered now, but I distinctly remember by like age five, just learning everything I could about any dinosaur I could get my hands on. And I could like name every dinosaur yet discovered alphabetically <laughs> and tell you basic knowledge about them. I was very, very into dinosaurs <laughs> and learning about them at a young age. Paleontologist was the first major profession I would tell adults when they asked what I wanted to be when I grew up. And the other thing that I was going to mention, or to to clarify, rather, was that any time you're talking about gender, particularly when you're talking about uh, how someone experiences gender, particularly at a young age, there is a difference between speaking about the gender that they feel and the gender that is imposed upon them. And when I had said you growing up as a cisgendered woman, I was more alluding to the world around you projecting that, regardless of how you felt. 
Yep, checks out. <laughs> Sounds about right. But we digress. This was about you and your gender identity and vocabulary that may or may not fit correctly. Right. So I was trying to remember exactly how this conversation came up, but I think we were beginning to talk about the public usage of pronouns, which I tend to not do. Um, th this is how the meh gender discussion came up. It was, yes, I'm used to he, him pronouns. Yes, I think they, them make sense because thinking that agender makes sense or thinking that gender, ne gender neutral terms in general make more sense. That seems logical. I don't have any issue with feminine pronouns, but they're not what I'm used to. About the only time I get referred to with feminine pronouns is by accident, and there's normally a fair amount of social like anxiety that comes with that as well. As in, we're sitting down at a restaurant and a waiter or waitress walks up and walks up behind me and addresses the table with feminine pronouns, and then they kind of walk around and I see their, oh shit, I just lost my tip face, like for, oh. a, for a moment. And it's just, I, it doesn't bother me. I tend to just ignore it and move on to avoid any awkwardness. Yeah, I think your anxiety in that situation isn't because someone misgendered you. It's because of the horrific anxiety you sense from them after realizing that they think that maybe that's what happened. It's there. There is also if if someone around me did start using she her pronouns to refer to me, it would take me a bit to get used to that, and I would kind of also wonder why is that the decision you're making right now? Because it it doesn't. It seems very simple to me to use neutral terms for someone. It seems like an odd choice to knowingly choose explicit masculine feminine terms to refer to someone, without them saying, "Hey, this is how I prefer to be addressed." But anyway, this conversation was about listing your preferred pronouns on any sort of public-facing site, profile, whatever, and I don't like doing that. It doesn't bother me that other people do that, but for me to put my pronouns down there, it feels like I'm being forced to play the gender game, and I don't, I don't identify with any of that, so it feels like I'm being made to, to masquerade with how everyone else sees people in society. And there's something about being forced to behave in a certain way that gets under my skin a little bit. So I think this conversation went, so if you fill out a profile, what are you going to put? And I said, I'm going to put Royce. <laughs> I'm going to put my first name and that is an appropriate way to address me. And then the conversation went, well, then what's your gender? And I said, meh. Meh. <laughs> yeah, that, that was an interesting conversation because... This was long before we, we set up a social media profile because, Royce, you are very not online, uh, with the exception of the Twitter account we started for this podcast specifically, but... Which you run almost exclusively. Well, <laughs> the question was actually kind of more about uh, conferences because pre... Th this, this conversation was years ago, way pre-COVID, I had seen an increasingly large number of people write their pronouns on name tags at conferences and conventions to the point where in some of the more progressive conferences, if you don't put your pronouns on your name tag, you're the weird one. <laughs> and, and nobody wants to misgender everyone. So it is very, very much an ally thing to do to try to ask someone for their pronouns. Um, especially if you're not sure. But that that can get a little complicated when there is someone like you who would just rather not have that conversation. And I know there are other people out there like you, but the thing is, the, the apathy keeps you from being very vocal about this, <laughs> but it, it's a valid experience. So, and... We, we started using med gender just like at home because you, let's be real, you weren't going out. You weren't actually having a conversation with anyone who wasn't me about pronouns and gender. 
But we were like, oh yeah, meh gender. We we were joking around that meh could actually be a a, a fine neo pronoun for some people, you know, instead of he or she or uh, she hers. Like, oh, just like pass me meh's phone. <laughs> like, why don't you text meh? And and that was that was just a joke. Neo pronouns are often used by people under the non-binary umbrella. Some of the more common ones that maybe you have heard are like Z Zier. They they haven't gotten into the mainstream consciousness um, outside of LGBT circles quite as much as like just the singular they them I have seen starting to really catch on, especially the last five years or so. So neo pronouns, totally valid. If someone uses neo pronouns and they tell you that, just use them again. Don't be a jerk. <laughs> but yeah, and then just like at home, I remember jo- jo- joking about uh, your pronouns just being Rice Rice's, uh, Rice Self, and put that on a name tag, Rice, 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 Rice's Rice Self. <laughs> because I, I do try to use Royce conversationally as often as possible, but there are some sentences where at a certain point you have said the name so many times and in order to make the sentence seem a little more conversational you should have just started the sentence completely differently and restructured it from the very beginning so sometimes you do box yourself into a hole and it's at that point where it's like oh no do i use he him do i use they them and any anybody who just wants to be a good friend or an ally wants to know the right answer, but there there isn't always a right answer, I suppose. But depending on who it is, there may not be a wrong answer either. Very well put. That is a good point. I do remember several years ago being interviewed for <laughs> a different podcast where we were sort of talking about uh, gender and asexuality and... You were not there, but you had given me permission ahead of time to to talk a little bit about your experience, if if it was relevant, because people are always very curious to know about uh, married asexual people, <laughs> and and I did bring up uh, med gender <laughs> as as a thing we lovingly created, and I just remember getting multiple comments on that podcast and people reaching out to me after the fact being like, that is the word that I have been looking for. (laughs) And some people being really excited. Um, I remember some people saying like, would Rice be angry if I started using med gender? Can I use that too? (laughs) And when I read those comments to you, you were like, you were, you were quite delighted. Actually, you, you were very amused by this, but at the same time, you were like, well, if they're actually that excited, maybe they aren't quite apathetic enough (laughs) to use med gender. But all this to say, it is all in good fun. Language is ever evolving. Different people have different associations to different vocabulary. So not every definition is going to be hard and fast or mean the same thing to different people. So whatever feels right to you, go for it. So in in your case, Royce, you, you have historically used he, him just because that's what society has put upon you, but more recently you have actually begun incorporating they, them, and you have occasionally lightly specified they, them when prompted for it. So can you talk a little bit more about why that conscious decision was made on your part? Part of it for me using they, them is with gender being spoken about so much more frequently now than it did many years ago. I've thought about it enough to come to the conclusion that agender is probably the right descriptor, and if agender is the right descriptor, then they, them is the right usage of pronouns. I think that in my own usage, I've tried to rework the way that I speak a little bit, either to avoid pronouns altogether or to use they, them, just because there are so many people out there that do identify as something that is not cisgender, and that seems like a a safer use of language when you're around people that you don't know very well. Now, it would help if I could remember people's names better. (laughs) That's a whole different issue. Because then I could default to that more frequently. 
So I was going to kind of ask why it seems as though you often have just like a general disdain for gendered pronouns, and yet your dislike of the gendered pronoun seems to far heavily outweigh your desire to emphasize and use gender neutral pronouns. But I, I think we did uh, sort of cover that a little bit where it was just, you know, you don't like playing gender, the game, <laughs> and uh, just sort of being forced into something that you don't experience in the same way other people who talk about it do, which definitely makes sense. But how great of like a board game would like gender the game be? <laughs> or would it be terrible? I think it'd be terrible. There'd be <laughs> the whatever form it would take place in, either the instruction manual or a deck of cards would have way too many words to like come to understand the meaning of. <laughs> I I am picturing like a very 90s style like board game box though. Like think sorry boxes, but just like gender the game and I don't know, maybe maybe everyone starts out without gender, but you you get like sent to gender jail and like, oh no, you've been assigned boy. <laughs> it could almost be like that game that we have played, Fog of Love, where it's basically a relationship simulator, <laughs> but you're kind of, you get your own goals. Uh, ahead of time. So you have your own individual goals and you have to try to meet those while still maintaining the broader relationship. I wonder if you, at the start of the game, either pick your gender or get randomly assigned one. And by the end of the game, you have to, to meet that goal somehow. <laughs> By the end of the game, you have to try to fit the game maker's possibly incorrect meaning of non-binary or manifestation of non-binary. Oh, absolutely. Who, whoever created this game did it horribly. And <laughs> all of the gender concepts are incredibly antiquated. If it takes a year or two for the game to come out, it's going to be even that <laughs> farther behind the times. Oh. Well, that's probably part of the release model, so they can charge more money for, uh, I almost said DLC, but this is a physical game. For the D we can it, make this a video game! It's, well, ex expansion packs. <laughs> they, they give you more cards as more terms come out. Oh, see, that that's how they get you. That's, mmm, sneaky capitalism, sneaky. Get your capitalism out of my gender. The fog of love. The homosexual editions were in an expansion. That's true. Oh, that's horrible. Fog of Love's such a weird game, and we didn't play nearly enough of it. Maybe we should play a game of Fog of Love on the podcast. <laughs> uh, maybe. Um, so, so this game, <laughs> this, this board game was created by a game designer who just really wanted his girlfriend, fiance, wife, partner, I can't remember exactly what their relationship was, but he really wanted her to play board games with him, but she didn't like board games. So he tried to take her favorite genre of media, which was romantic comedies, and make it into a board game so they could play together. So tweet at us at the ace couple if you want us to play this game and record it as a future podcast episode. It's 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 a silly game. It's kind of interesting mechanically, but it's very um very cishet from from our what maybe we played two rounds of it. Very allo perhaps. It might be interesting. <laughs> for us to play one of the more dicey versions that could involve like an explicit fling or something like that. There are different scenarios that you play through and some of them are very aloe. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll keep that in our back pocket as a as a maybe. That could be interesting to hear an ace couple <laughs> do that. Yeah, we never really did play any of the dicier scenarios of that game. We kind of just wanted to play the uh, brunch date one, and we made breakfast burritos and mimosas and sat at home and had a little Sunday brunch board game <laughs> date. <laughs> We've also had situations with this game and other games where we have some fun with it, but then we wait a year or two before picking it up again, and at that point we've forgotten all of the rules and kind of have to start at the simplest scenario again anyway. 
That does happen. That's that's a real problem we got to work on. <laughs> so yeah, that game definitely like like you said there was a an expansion or a second edition where you could get a same sex couple uh, kind of situation going on. So goodness knows if there's any chance of getting like any gender queer representation in a game like that anytime soon. I guess speaking of which, do you identify with the term gender queer? Does that what what does that mean to you? Well, I think the concept that I keep going back to is that I don't identify with any of the terms. Agender makes sense logically, and if gender queer is a, an umbrella term for really anything that is outside of cisgender, then that would mean agender is underneath the gender queer umbrella. So in a roundabout way, I would say I guess, yeah. Yeah, definitionally, but not emotionally, perhaps? <laughs> That's kind of how this whole thing goes, yeah. Sometimes it seems like your experience as it pertains to gender is just better, less defined by the pocket dictionary and more just like memed. Because I've definitely seen the memes that are like, my pronouns are none. Do not refer to me. <laughs> and I think that's a little, a little too on the nose <laughs> for you. So this is a tough question that isn't going to have a specific answer, but it's a starting point because I want to hear you talk about it. How long have you suspected that you aren't a cisgender man? Yeah, that question doesn't really have a definitive answer because by the time I knew what the term cisgender meant, by the time that language started entering common discourse, I was way past completely throwing away the concept of gender. So it was just more terminology that didn't fit with me, I guess. You were like, gender? I've never heard of her. <laughs> but were there any sort of like, I don't want to say milestone moments, because that almost puts a lot more emphasis on it than I know you have, but were there any memories that you have from any point in your life of just really realizing like, yep, this gender thing isn't for me. Because I, I know when we talk about asexuality, there are some situations where you're like, when I saw that on TV, or when I heard someone talk about this, I felt really asexual. Were, or were there any times in your life where you're like, mm hmm, that's, that's confirmation. Not explicitly. And maybe it's just something that's been kind of Maybe it's something that's just been present for a long time in one way or another, or maybe it's been more subtle. I can't think of many examples, but I think the realization that a lot of what people actually mean when they start to talk about gender, at least from a social level, was stereotypical and that we generally refer to stereotypes as being negative because they tend to be inaccurate. Public discourse about stereotypes is often about how they're used to discriminate in one way or another, is, is what I mean by that. And I think I realized that at a young enough age that it wasn't surprising to feel detached from, from gender. The only thing that's really coming to mind is when someone would talk very explicitly about masculinity or femininity and say, like, this is what it's like to be a man or this is what it's like to be a woman, I've just always kind of thought that's dumb. Like, you're a person before you are any gender. So, like, if you're trying to apply a stereotype to someone, it's always going to be some level of inaccurate. But I also kind of assumed that that's what any self-aware person thought without it's having that conversation. <laughs> Most people don't think that way. So here, here's a question for you, because by this point, we, we've talked openly about how we met and our, our asexual love story. And at the time we met online on OkCupid, asexuality was not even an orientation that you could select, but they didn't have an expanded gender selection either. So we were both kind of listed as straight, I think. <laughs> Um, I think we were both straight and I, I was a woman and I think you, you were, you were definitely listed as a man too. But do you think like in a world where we did not meet if right now, if you were to 
set up a new OkCupid profile, do you think you would go through that selection process differently? I don't know for sure, because the purpose of being on a dating site is to meet people. And if I don't particularly care about my gender, it's probably in my best interest to check the boxes that are actually going to help me meet the most people, whereas having a listing a gender and asexual is probably going to remove me from a lot of searches with people that I might be able to get along with just fine if we actually had a conversation, even if those are the more accurate answers. But that is using a site as a means to an end, not really using it as a chronicle of my identity. It's not a reflection of your soul. (laughs) Which I do think is very interesting, because when we met, we didn't have these gender conversations. In fact, it was well into our marriage before you sort of defined things in, in whatever way you can. And yet it came as no surprise to me and was actually reaffirming in in a way <laughs> and and made a lot of sense to me because when we when we very first started speaking even when we were still long distance we kind of both being very monogamously minded people we kind of just like shut down looking for other people cuz we were like okay found one <laughs> and luckily luckily it worked for us but i was like viscerally opposed to calling you my boyfriend, even though, like, judging by your profile, like, you were listed as a man. And there was just something where I was like, mm, no, that that doesn't feel quite right. And I remember having the conversation with you about, like, what are, what are labels? Like, are, are we putting a label on this? I suggested the term partner, and you immediately said, yeah, I like the word partner. Was that just in the moment that sounded good, or... Was there anything sort of inside of you that were was like, yeah, that's that's actually a gender neutral word and I didn't even have to ask for it? Yeah, I think it's more of the latter. I think it's a term that says as much as people need to know with, without inferring extra information. Uh, because partner also doesn't say anything about... It, it doesn't put a label on how serious by conventional terms mm. uh, a relationship is. If you compare that to boyfriend, fiance, wife, husband, all of that, like partner gives the people you're speaking to the information that they need to know for the purposes of that conversation. Which, yeah, and I I don't even know what, what in me was like, you are my partner, not a boyfriend. Like, immediately, it never even occurred to you, to me, to, to call you my boyfriend. Even just talking about it theoretically, it sounds kind of, kind of wrong. <laughs> like, that that's not quite correct. And I, I have said husband on occasion, sort of in the same way I'll say he, him on occasion, when referring to you when I, when I box myself into a, a sentence structure where I've already said Royce four times in the same sentence. But I, I usually default to spouse, which I think is very nice. Although that's one frustrating thing. I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent here. I, that's my least favorite part of the Swedish language. Hello, we're talking about Swedish in this podcast. <laughs> I, I'm learning Swedish. I've been learning Swedish for a number of years now. And they do not have a gender neutral word for spouse. It's always the equivalent of, you know, husband and wife. And that just absolutely upsets me every time I talk about <laughs> Royce in, in Swedish. Because, I mean, talk about pronouns. I mean, so many different languages have a binary pronoun kind of gender situation going on. And even Swedish has gendered words. Not not quite to the extent of some other languages. I, I learned a fair bit of Spanish back in school. Not as much as I would have liked to, but that's a very gendered language. Swedish is a little bit of the same way, but they have a very nice middle ground because for he and she, you have han and hon, but you can say hen to just split the difference and do a gender neutral. And I really like that. It flows very well in sentences and I can just use hen without even thinking about it, even though I'm not totally fluent in that language yet. So that's very nice, but there's no gender neutral word for spouse. (laughs) And I can't stand that. I can technically say partner. That still works. But 
I will stop ranting about the Swedish language now. It's a lovely language. That's my that's my one <laughs> critique. If there are any Swedish listeners out there who know of a new progressive word that is a gender neutral version of that, please let me know because I've been trying to look for it. But for the most part, it looks like in in Sweden, most people who are talking about LGBT and gender issues, they just flip back to English, which doesn't help the English speaker who's learning Swedish very much. At any rate, there are many, many non-binary people, or NBs, as some would say, who are trans. They identify with that term. Definitionally speaking, there is no doubt that it fits when you consider that the main component of transness is having a gender identity different from the one you were assigned at birth. And like all identities, it is an umbrella term, but there are people on the non-binary spectrum who do not identify as trans, and you are one of them. So could you perhaps talk a little bit about what the word trans means to you and why you personally don't see that as part of your own experience? Yeah, so the first time you brought up trans as a potential non-binary or agender identity, I was a little surprised for a moment because that hadn't occurred to me. Thinking about it more, I, I get why that would make sense for some people, but the term doesn't really make sense for me. And I think it's it's because when I think about trans, I think about the act of actually transitioning. And I don't necessarily mean that in a physical way, but it, for me, it kind of implies that there was some sort of transition period, whether that was a, a period of acknowledgement or affirmation or reclamation or something. And I just don't feel like I have gone through any notable change or had a moment of awakening. I think that I've pretty much been the way that I am my whole life, and I think that my identifying as a gender is more of a disregard for the labels that society has placed, not a transition away from them. So the concept that trans is being different now than you were assigned at birth well, if I don't really acknowledge that social assignment at birth, I didn't transition away from that either. Yeah, which, I and I mean the the trans meaning transition to you does not at all mean that someone who is trans, who that is the identity that is accurate to their experience, that does not mean that anyone has to transition or that there is a right or a wrong way to do that. And it certainly doesn't mean that, you know, people who are closeted and trans and, and haven't come out yet are any less trans. But I, th- I think what you're maybe getting at is Like, you are not changing your labels, you are shirking all of the labels, so why would you personally choose to add a new label to your desire to cast off all of the labels? Right, it it just doesn't really fit for how I feel. It's it's another another box, or a, a larger box with several boxes inside of it that I... You see, the box is a spectrum. There are so many boxes. But yes, in case that that wasn't clear, Courtney, you've you've said this a couple of times, but the whole purpose of this episode was to try to take whatever it is inside my head and throw it onto the microphone and make sense of it, not to try to categorize other people. Yeah, because in the Russian nesting doll (laughs) that is gender experience and sexuality spectrums, There are so many micro-labels under umbrella terms. The whole point of all of this is to use what resonates with you and what makes sense and what is useful to you if you're using the language as a tool to express yourself to others in the world. That is what they are there for. But on the other side, if labels don't work for you, if it doesn't make sense, if it doesn't feel right that is no less valid of an experience. And my my one big fear with, well, not just this episode, but talking about our own personal experiences 
at all on any level is that someone's going to hear our experience and think that we're trying to project that on the entire community, either the entire asexual community or the entire agender community. And that is never going to be our intention whatsoever. But having these very historically invisible identities, there's this sort of widespread feeling of needing to walk on eggshells when you're talking about your own experience, especially online, on Twitter, when you're able to communicate with hundreds of people at a time who you've never met in person. Some of these communities can get really, really defensive of their own labels, and it's really important to know that labels just aren't going to mean the same to everybody. And when we're talking about our own experiences, it is truly just that. It is our own. And we want to emphasize that and also say that like our experience is not the end-all be-all. If, if we are the first asexual people you've ever listened to, don't stop there. Go and find other asexual experiences so you can get a more well-rounded outlook for what this identity is and who we are as a community. And if Royce is the first med gender person <laughs> you've ever heard from, seek out others because you could very easily find someone who says, yes, I am a gender. They might feel very, very strongly about that. They might very heavily emphasize, you know, they, them pronouns only. It will feel bad and wrong if you use a gendered pronoun to refer to me, and they might consider themselves trans, and their experience is absolutely correct and valid. But I really do keep coming back to the <laughs> to the memes that say my pronouns are none. There are a lot of people who, who see those memes and they're like, yup, that is me. I feel that. So even if they aren't the most visible voices, even if they aren't the loudest voices in the conversation, they are still there. So Royce, given everything we've just talked about and the fact that you are now a somewhat open and public uh, queer person online... How do you feel about the fact that multiple people in the last month or two have asked you what your pronouns are? Meh. Nah. <laughs>